Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank God for what God is doing and what he's going to do. I tell you, he's up to something. He's up to something. We are continuing tonight with this message, the call. And I know some of y'all left here last night drunk. I, I was totally, totally, totally just in the third heaven, I guess, about the best way I can put it. And the Lord just dealt with me all night long. Not about what I preach, but what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is the call to concentration. And I'm going like, okay, I'm just doing this. I don't, I don't have enough time to cover all what you're saying to me. And I'm talking about when I got home, got into bed, the Lord just talked with me all through the morning and everything. And so I usually take my wife to work, and she was like, okay, I'm going to drive because you, you stay here and just, just stay right here. So she drove, and I ended up staying. And I'm telling you, what, there's, there was a, you remember that saying I used to have, what is what if everything you knew about church was wrong? And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the call for to, the call to consecration is what God has been waiting on. I shared a little bit today with Pastor Chris, and I said, I, my question was, and see this part right, the truth about consecration is what God has been waiting on for the body of Christ to come to. Because there is a part of his glory that he wants to give us so that we'll be able to stand the judgment and the trials that God has given to place on the face of the earth. The, the, the prophecy says that men's heart will fail them of the things that's going to come upon the earth. And their heart's going to fail them because of fear. But that is when we consecrate ourselves and get ourselves in line so that, listen to me, so that we can follow the spirit of truth. And this is what's missing. Jesus said in the 16th chapter of St. John, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will lead and guide us into all truth. We have the Holy Spirit, and the only thing we've been doing is dancing and speaking in tongues. When it comes to following the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead us into truth, we are afraid to follow him to truth because it is contrary to what the doctrine of men is teaching us. And so instead of following the Holy Spirit to truth, we follow the doctrine of men. And therefore, it causes us not to grow up in him. And when he said that to me, my heart just dropped. And the next thing he said to me is that if a person who have not grown, grown up in me, and you're still operating the gifts, you're a prophesy, people will get healed, people will get delivered. Because the gifts and calling will work without repentance. And you will still think you got it made with God. When you don't. Because what he's looking for is sons. And we have to grow up in his image and in his likeness to be sons. And that's the deception concerning works. 
Because as we grow in his image and his likeness, works in our life cease. I'm going to say this a minute, I'm going to go on. Now watch this. He took me to the scripture, I think it's in Luke, where Jesus went to Peter's mother-in-law's, to his mother-in-law's house. And his mother-in-law was sick. Jesus healed her. She got up and she fixed him something to eat and they ate. They, and then the people found out that Jesus was there and they came. It was so many people. So Jesus went out and he prayed for people and they were healed. Then Jesus went back in the house and ate and he went to sleep. He got up early the next morning, went up into the mountain and prayed. The disciples came and found him there and they said, Master, when did you come to this place? He said, there are people there that are waiting for you to come and heal them. And Jesus said this to them. And this blew my mind because I never paid attention to this before. He said, come on, we're going to that city. He left those people standing at that house sick. He did not go back and heal them that was waiting for him. And then the Spirit spoke this to me. See, I did not heal everybody. And that's what we've been told. Everywhere Jesus went, he healed everybody. And he says, I did not heal everybody where I went. He says, because more people that follow me only wanted healing. They do not want me. He says, so you must understand in your ministry and what I've given you to do, that I am not going to heal everybody. Because most people don't really want me. They only want the healing and go about their lives the way they want to be without me. So don't waste my gifts on those who don't want me. Now, we can never discern the hearts of people without the Spirit. We can never get to this place if we don't answer the call to consecration. Some of y'all going, wow, this sounds like a leadership class or something. <laughs> but I'm telling you, this, this is so powerful. And watch this. When a person began to understand how powerful and how important consecration between us and him is, it opens up your mind and your heart to understand what it is that he really wants from you. If I were to ask you in this room what it is that Jesus really wants from you, everybody, probably most of you will say something churchy or religious. You probably really, really and truly don't know. He wants me to be a son. Okay, That's true. Now how are you going to be a son? I'm going to live right. I'm going to do that's right. That's pleasing the Lord. Now do you know what pleases the Lord? No, you don't. Why? Because you haven't learned how to follow the spirit of truth. Until the person that you listen to Learn how to follow the spirit of truth. You will never know the truth of God. Are you hearing me? Yes. We've been listening to scribes and Pharisees. Yes. 
All right. Wow. So the call is consecration. The word consecration in the Hebrew, it literally means separation. Now, the separation could be from anything. What you need to find out is what it is that has offended God that you need to consecrate yourself from. Well, my pastor told me I need to consecrate myself. I need to go on a consecration. You can never separate yourself from something to something unless you're able to know what it is. Some of y'all with me on Broad Street should remember that. All right. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Yeah, chapter 20. And go to verse 6. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6. He tells us, one of the uh, writers in the New Testament tells us that the gifts and calling will work without repentance. So you see people praying and people getting healed and people are prophesying and, and you say they're so anointed. And then all of a sudden you find out they called in sin and then you still see God using them. And you say, well, okay. Well, maybe God forgive them, but they're still practicing the sin. All right, let's, let's hit home with it. You and I both know that we have done something and God still speak to us. And we have still operated and preached and did and all this kind of stuff that we have not repented of and God still uses. That's what he's talking about. Gifts and calling are without repentance. And the reason it still worked, the gifts still work, was because the fact that it is what it is, a work. And the gifts that we have are never for us. It's always for somebody else. That's why it works. The only way you can change is through consecration. How many of you have ever studied the journey of the children of Israel. I'm talking, I ain't talking about just read it. I'm talking about study. When I'm talking about study, I'm talking about character study, learn from the behavior, learn what God was trying to get them to learn. I'm talking about really actually studied it to the point that you see the whole picture and the meaning. I know I've given you some, show you some things, especially with the mixed multitude. You need to see, study it, and see the whole picture behind it, what it was that God was trying to get them to see and learn. And then Paul says these things was written for our example that we won't fall in the same error of what? What was it? What was it? What was their, what was their sin? Unbelief. Exactly. Unbelief that we won't fall in the same air of unbelief. And that's what we have to grab hold of. All right? So, Exodus 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth or after, such as have familiar spirit, 
and at the wizards to go whoring after them. Another word for whoring is lusting. Let me give another word that y'all won't take it. <laughs> Think that it's not really serious. Desire. The word whoring, desiring, and lusting is all the same. There is no difference. You got a strong desire that causes you to change your mind, your attitude, or your behavior towards something. That desire has already turned to lusting, but in your religious self, you say, I'm not lusting, I just desired it. No, you lusted because it changed your behavior. It broke your consecration. It caused you to change who you are. Oh, God. Somebody said, go ahead, Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> um, ain't nobody saying nothing. <laughs> he says, I will even set my face against a soul and will cut him off from among his people. So he says, sanctify yourself therefore and be ye holy for I'm the Lord your God and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. And this word sanctify uh, and, and, and um, consecrate He's actually telling them to be holy. Now watch it. What did I tell you what a saint or consecration is? Separate yourself from something to something. So God is saying, I want you to be holy. God is holy. So you leave something that is unclean and go to God who is clean. You cannot just lay out there in the limbo. And say, come on, God. He said, come to me. Now watch this. Are you ready for this? Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Now listen to me. The day you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, you became or we became the temple of God. I'm going to say it one more time. The day you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you became, we became the temple of God. Do you understand what that means? In order for the Holy Spirit to come in your life, you had to be clean. Y'all sit down. <laughs> What's wrong with y'all? Now you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Holy Spirit all these years. Watch this. And you've been still seeking. You're still praying for more of God. You've been going... Watch, watch this, and you've been asking him to make you holy. He's already set you apart, sanctified you, set you apart. The only thing he asks you to do is to modify the deeds of your body. That means correct your behavior. Bring your body under subjection yes. to your spirit. And your spirit is holy. So whatever my flesh does, 
only pollutes my flesh, but not my spirit. Because God cannot be polluted. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> oh my God. Whenever you get a strong desire to sin, it is not coming out of your spirit. It's coming out of the appetite of your flesh. Yes. The Holy Spirit will never lead us to sin. So whenever you are the sinning, the more the Holy Spirit has become less leading in your life and your flesh becomes stronger. The more you consecrate yourself to him, the more the flesh is subdued and becomes submissive to the Spirit of God. How do you do that? Why is it that Israel kept repeating the same sin throughout his history until God got tired of them. He gave Israel, which was the ten nations, uh, northern nations, he gave her a bill of divorcement, and he said, he says, I'm tired of Israel. He gave her a bill of divorcement. He called her a backsliding heifer, and he left her home, and he only kept Benjamin and Judah to himself, and they were remnant. And they represented all of Israel. And they called them a remnant. Rather than destroy the whole nation, he only saved the remnant. Just a remnant. Because of the promise that he made to Abraham. And Abraham said, what if my seed will turn against you and begin to serve other gods? And God said, I will save a remnant. That's what he promised Abraham. And that's what he did. Rather than screwing the whole seed, he kept a remnant. Judah and Benjamin. They were the preservers of the promise that God made to Abraham. All the rest of them went whoring after other nations and turned their back on God. Why did they do that? Because they did not have the spirit of truth in them. And they could not serve it. So God had to do something different. He put his spirit in mankind to allow it to lead and guide man. But there was a problem with man. He was both born again, yes, but he was also flesh. And his flesh, since he lived in his flesh longer, his flesh was more dominant than the spirit of God that was in him. And the only way he can make his flesh less dominant on control of him was through fasting and praying and consecration. <laughs> wow. In the old days, when I come up in the old school, that's all they talked about was fasting and praying. Mm -hmm. How many churches you hear today talk about fasting and praying? <laughs> What's that? I ain't never heard that. Churches are so, mega churches are so full now, so packed. They don't have time for it. They can't talk about it. Go to Exodus thirty-two twenty-nine. If we don't, if we don't begin to understand how important it is, so it means to separate. Consecrate means to separate. So you separate yourself from one thing and you cleave to another. You have, you cannot cleave 
to that of God that you don't understand. And I pray that y'all are getting the understanding. Because when I finish this, I think you will have an understanding of what of God that you needed. Let me put it this way. If you, if you can get just a glimpse of what I've already seen, just a glimpse of what I've already seen, then you will know that I need to get hold of God, period. It, we, when we look at church and we look at ministry and that's what we get caught up in and we get caught up about that is the farthest thing from God's agenda he is concerned about you you are concerned about working he don't care about the work he care about the sheep. I'm going to say it again. He care about the sheep. He told the disciples to go get the sheep. When they translated the Bible, they left some of that. And some, in Matthew, they left that out and they changed it and said, go into the world and preach the gospel. That's not what Jesus said. When he told the disciple, he said, go and get my sheep. I'm going to send you among sheep and goat, but I need you to get my sheep. When you preach the gospel, my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow. What did it say? I don't want everybody. But we're trying to win everybody when he don't want everybody. The, let the wheat and the tear grow together. But you have to be led by the Spirit to know what's a tear and what's a wheat. So you let the tear alone and deal with the wheat. Why? Because in the end of the age, the angel is going to come and get the tear. I ain't, I, ain't got, I ain't got time to deal with the tear. I am to give and give the word to the wheat so that the wheat can become the sun. So that when Jesus returned, the sun, the sheep, will become as he is. It's about us growing up in him. And when we get lost up in church, and fall under the spell of witches and warlocks. What did you just say? I say we fall under the spell of witches and warlocks. And that's those pastors who are controlling. And won't allow you to follow the spirit. Won't allow you to get close to God. Won't allow you to spend time with God. Won't allow you to follow the leading of the spirit. They try to control God using you. Those are witches and warlocks. Those are kings of men. And the prophet Elijah, not me, but there's a spirit of Elijah that God's prophesied that will come. In these days, that will come. The spirit of Elijah will come. And there's a ministry that Elijah proper did during those days of the kings. And that anointing is going to come against these preachers and pastors and bishops and apostles. That spirit is going to come in the last days before the Lord return. And he's going to deal and he's going to judge just like he did those days back in the days. That spirit of Elijah is going to return. And these spirits of Ahab and Jezebel are going to face Elijah again. In the book of Revelation, it's called the two witnesses. And they're coming against these preachers that have these type spirits. (laughs) 
Like I said, if you could see what I have seen. All right. Where well, I tell you to go? Exodus 32, 29. I got to get going here. Exodus 32, 29. All right. For Moses have said, consecrate yourselves today to what? The to the Lord. Now watch what he tells you. E even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing. He said, when you consecrate yourself to the Lord, that every man and, every, and upon his son and all this, he said, that the Lord may bestow upon you a blessing. Now Israel has sinned, and he was telling them, separate yourself from your sin. Repent. Now separate yourself from your sin and, 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 and cleave to God. Now God's going to bless you. All right. Let's go to the next. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs 23, 26. Proverbs 23 and 26. Repent. The call. Now God is calling. Once we got into this and understand this, now God is calling for consecration. Why are you turning? Let me say this. People fast. They go on a fast. The purpose of fasting is whatever has a stronghold in your life that you're dealing with that is hindering your relationship for, with God, that is what you're supposed to fast from. You never fast to get close with God, to God, if you have the Holy Spirit. So, so stupid. You have the Holy Spirit inside you and you're going to fast to get close to God. Did y'all hear what I just said? Yes. Somebody say amen. Amen. You have the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you're going to go on a 40 day fast to get close to God. Come off the fast and say, what happened? Nothing happened. Say, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And I'm going to say, I know. Your fasting was in unbelief. When God called me aside for 40 days, he didn't tell me to fast. He said, eat one meal a day. Go to work, eat one meal a day, and get into a book of Revelation and start reading. Do you know what that was? That wasn't a fast. That was a consecration. <laughs> ah. I separated myself from something to something. So if you want to get close to God and have an encounter, you separate yourself from something that is drawing your attention away from God and then give God your attention. So if you've been watching TV when you get home, shut it off, spend time just sitting in the presence of the Lord and begin to pray and begin to tell the Lord how much you love him. Don't open your Bible and start reading. Just commune with him. Make it between you and him, you and him. Play music to draw your heart and your attention to him. It's about him. Go on a date with you and God. Most people don't have those encounters is because they approach God with a religious mindset. A religious mindset is paganism. <laughs> religious mindset is paganism because it, it, it's a mindset that comes out of unbelief because you are hoping for something to happen. 
When you go on a fast and seeking God and you consecrate yourself, you're not hoping for something. You are expecting. Because you know who he is. You know who he is to you. And you know who he is. You know who he is to you and you know I don't know what I'm giving you to say. <laughs> oh, you, heard, you got what I'm saying? Yes. We, we, we don't make the relationship between us and him personal. The moment you say, he's my God, you, oh, mm, he, <laughs> you become afraid of him. The only time you should fear him is when you have cursed him. When you have sinned against him. That's the only time you should fear him. Listen to what he says. I want to take you and hold you under my wings as a, as a hen her, gathers her biddies. Come away, my beloved, and walk with me in my garden. This is an expression. Then he says when he's angry. It's a bad thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. That's when you have sinned against him seven times. Because now you made him angry. But look how many times you got there. Seven times. And that's willful. And he's still waiting for you to repent. He's not like that. Religious mindset gets you to have a point that you walk around and afraid that God's going to do this and God's going to do that and God. Why? Because they haven't read. They really don't, know, really don't know God. Now look what God did to Israel. Look what, but look what Israel was doing to God. Oh, I'm scared of Book of Revelation. I won't read because my God, all that stuff, the evil stuff, that bad stuff will be happening in Revelation. I will, I'm scared, I'm scared. But look what God, what the people was doing that caused God to do this. How in the world God can be a God of love and he causing all this stuff to happen? You don't understand. There is, there's a law that's established. It's called sowing and reaping. Do you do it? You reap what you do. So if you love God, guess what you reap? But we think that way and feel that way because of the religious system. We really don't see him the way he really is. Why? We really don't know him. Why? No. We really don't know him. Why? Because we haven't spent time with him. We spent time with church. All right. Did I read that? No. What is what we at? Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 and 20, 26. 26. Oh Lord, yes. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Now what is, when he say give me your heart, what is he talking about? Is he talking about your heart that pumps the blood? What is he talking about? Your mind. Give me your mind 
and let your what? Your eyes observe my way. So watch. Give me your mind so that I can cause you to know and understand my ways. When you spend time with him, watch this. How many of you love prophecy? I know I shouldn't have asked that because I know people ain't going to answer. Now listen, let me tell you something. Let me put it this way. Prophecy, prophecy is literally, the Hebrew definition of prophecy is to speak the mind of God. That's what prophetic utterance is, to speak the heart and mind of God. All right. So that means that we get to know what's on God's mind concerning a person or situation or thing. That's why Proverbs is saying here. So when we spend time with God and begin to be personal, we get to know God's heart or God's mind concerning things or concerning people. The English definition of prophecy to, to speak prophetically uh, past, present, and future, and all that, yeah, that's all right. But you leave off the part about knowing God's mind. If I tell you that I know the what's going to put send people to the lake of fire, which is the final judgment, God already got that plan. He already got that written out, what, what, uh, what it is that people, that's going to send people there. That's already planned. And people who's going to go there, I've already seen them there. Because I've been there and I looked over and I saw the preachers in there. How is it that I can see something that has not happened yet? Because when God created, he finished it. Y'all. Yeah. So in the spirit realm, it's already finished. So prophetically, I can see what God has purpose. Because spirit realm has already completed. Naturally, we're working out what's already done. Did not Jesus tell Zacchaeus, I saw you before sitting up in this sycamore tree? Because prophetically, it was already done. So when we get close to him and consecrate ourselves, we are allowed to know God's heart concerning things. This is the power of being in a relationship with God as we consecrate ourselves to him. We get to know him. And it's not so much about being a great prophet because getting to know this will cause men to be afraid of you who is not living right. Remember when Elijah showed up in, 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 in Israel and Jezebel and Ahab found out that he was there. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because they knew that he would bring the judgment of God on them. So they start killing all the prophets. And when Elijah showed up, oh, you come to bring God's judgment on us. And they sought to kill him. And God protected. They were afraid of Elijah. This is what God wants to do with the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is too much like the scribes and the Pharisees. So what he wants to do, he cannot do as a whole in general. So he got, pro he got prophets that are actually literally living in caves. What do you mean? In other words, they are not in the norm. They are off to themselves, hidden in cave because the 
the, the system won't accept them because they are real and they are outcasts. They don't fit in. As God told Elijah, I have 5,000 that have not yet bowed. And they are so, this consecration is what God is trying to get us here. You are here because God wants you to understand what consecration is. Some, some of you, somebody in this room is planning on going on a fast. All right, so the fast is good. But the fast you're going to go on is not going to solve your problem. What's going to solve your problem is you consecrating yourself. God has to be the center. You have to want God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. It has to be about God. And that which separates you from God that you know that it is not holy between you and God, that's what you have to cut off. It's not that God cannot hear. It's not that God cannot hear. It's your iniquity that is separate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. So we want God to do all this, do all, do all this, but we don't want to consecrate ourselves. Watch this. We repent of some things, but we hold on to the iniquity. And then wonder why God ain't doing it. Whew. My God. Let's keep moving here. Go to Romans 12 and 1. <laughs> Somebody say I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> consecration. Did y'all think consecration was like this? Ma'am? You say something more? What she said? I'm tell I, 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 I'm telling I'm telling you, we have to get back. Everybody, repeat after me. Courage, <laughs> praise. Everybody, repeat after me. Holiness is still right. Holiness is still right. When Jesus returns. When Jesus returns or when you die. When Jesus returns or when you die, you got to be holy. Because if you die in this life and you're not holy, you're going to bust hell wide open. Holiness is still right. Because whatever state you in, when you die, that's the state you remain. Because there is no change at the death. I know what they told you in church. But I also know what I saw in the third chamber. In 1 John, I, I think it, maybe it might be in 3 John. No, it's 1 John. He says that when he appear, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be just like him. What is he? He has a glorified body without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, or any such thing. That's what we got to get to. And you cannot get there without following the spirit of truth. And if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit who's going to lead and guide us into all truth and keep following the traditions of men, you will never put in place consecration and separate yourself from the things that is keeping you from having a glorified body. Because we don't know. Only the Spirit knows. Somebody holler the call. The call. The call. I watched the 
Azuzu, the history of the Zuzu ministry that happened back in the early 1900s in California. And I cannot remember the guy that prophesied this. God gave a word, a prophecy, that when the Zuzu came out, and all the signs and wonders and everything that was taking place and that was documented or what was taking place on the Zuzu, that out of that movement was going to come a false movement and that people were going to get caught up in the signs and wonders that the, the gospel and the doctrine of the gospel would become polluted to the point that they that the gospel itself will become impure and they will get lost and it has it, i mean it is totally the message and things that they preach seymour and all those guys that they preach that they preach jesus and the people who began to follow that and come out of that they was caught up in the signs and wonders and that's what they tried to duplicate and this is why you see all these big ministries now that are reading their people's books and all this kind of stuff and, and trying to teach people how to do all the healing and signs and wonders and miracles and stuff like this and do not have consecrations. Seymour gave himself to prayer and to fasting and reaching out to God and all this stuff. And you got people that are looking for shortcuts. I've had people come up to me and have seen how God used me and they come and they want, I want what you got. I want you, I want you to transfer that on me. Thank you. They have. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one, one preacher came in there and I laid and kept coming, kept coming to me and I said, nope, nope, nope. I said, you know. And finally he came at me one last time and I said, you know what, okay. I laid my hands on, I said, Lord, kill him. And he goes, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, you said you wanted what I got? I said, I died. Well, you should have told me that. I said, if you'd have told me that, I wouldn't have asked. I said, no. You the one, you the one lusting. You only asked for out of lust. You asked and you didn't know what you was asking for. I died. And he went through stuff too. He went through by me. And we have to understand what it is. The, and this is the thing. We, we think we know what God wants. How are you going to know if you never go to God and ask him? You've been running to preacher to preacher trying to find out what God wants for you. I used to people spend counseling time talking to people. I need to know what the Lord has for me. I, somebody told me you was a prophet. I said, yeah, but God used me to prophecy. Well, I need, can you tell me what the Lord wants? Um, well, I, I see the Lord and that's what I used to do. But I, I had to get wisdom. No, I don't see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, why you say it like that? Call you lazy. What? Why are you you mean? No, I had to be this way to make you go and seek the Lord for yourself. You're lazy. I ain't gonna come. I ain't gonna come back here no more. I tell you why. I ain't gonna never join this church. Good. Got enough lazy people around here already. <laughs> and this is and this is why people flock to prophets. Because they are lazy. All right, one more. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Man, y'all, I could stay on this one for a while. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. <laughs> and be not conformed to this world. In other words, you present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, but don't look like the world. <laughs> but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Man, I can tell you that. Are y'all understanding this? So he said, be you transformed. Don't be like the world, but be you transformed so that you can prove what is the will of God. What is the will of God? Brother, 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 uh, brother Ben. I see the kingdom of God coming to you. I see you driving a Rolls Royce. I see you living in a big old house. God really blessing you, brother Ben. You just keep on right obeying God. God's really going to give you the wealth of this world, the kingdom of God is going to just really bless you, Bill. <laughs> Brother Ben looking just like the world. But he said, be transformed. Be ye transformed so that you can prove what is the perfect will of God. Now, why he say perfect will of God? Because the perfect will of God is in things that do not rust, corrupt, mm -hmm. or men steal. <laughs> the things of the kingdom, Jesus said, do not rust, do not corrupt, or mold, or anything like this, and man cannot steal. So he says, set your affection, your desires on things which are above. But the religious system got you set your affection on things on the earth. Paul here is telling you, be transformed. When you transform and consecrate yourself towards God, he will supply, watch this, you ready? I'm going to give you the truth. He will supply your needs. We ain't satisfied because we ain't consecrated. I had to identify what was need and what was lust. What was need and what was lust. All that was in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. So I had to identify what was lust and what was need. Was I seeking the Lord for what I was lusting for? Or was I seeking the Lord for what I need? <laughs> now, 
Let me read the next verse and then we're going to be finished. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one member members one of another. So everybody think soberly of himself and not highly. So you pay attention to your things to so make sure that you're not uh, Remember what I told you last night, that we have to be able to uh, discern the appetites of the flesh from, I mean, the appetites of the flesh is our greatest thing that we have to deal with and not so much as the devil. Because we already have authority and power over the devil. The thing that we don't have power over the most is our flesh. Why? Because we have to learn how to control it. The devil what? Comes and goes. Your flesh don't. <laughs> you got to deal with that every day. So you have to learn how. What if um, 1 Corinthians 9.27 Paul said, I beat my body under subjection. That's what Paul said. He said, I had to beat my body under subjection, lest I become a castaway. He said, while I preached to others, I myself had to beat my own body under subjection, lest I become a castaway. Now, if Apostle Paul had to deal with his flesh, now watch this. His thorn in the flesh. Anybody know what his thorn in the flesh? Some of y'all do. I told y'all what his thorn. Some of y'all told him. What his thorn in the flesh was his fear of being exalted. Because of the abundance of revelation and, and, and revelations he had, visitations he had with God, and how God used him. He wrestled with being exalted above measure. So he had a fear of being exalted. And that was his thorn in the flesh. And he prayed and asked God to do And God said, my grace is enough. It's right there. And he says it right there in that scripture. And I don't know where these people got this all. Day. He had a limp. He had something wrong with his leg or had something this right here. Somebody said he had something with his eye. You know, if I would, and he says it right there in the scripture that he, had, he was afraid to be exalted above measure. Puffed up. And one translated, he was afraid that he was going to be puffed up in his ego. When God uses a person and, and mightily and signs and wonders, that's your, your flesh is your number one enemy. You, you let, oh, oh, Pastor Forte, oh, I love your message. Oh, God, oh, my God, God just really bless you. Well, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Oh, my God, yes, oh, my God, oh, I love your teaching. You know, oh. And I'd be like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Get out. I know this flesh don't you know, the person that's been rejected a lot and you start hearing this you know, oh, I think it is no you got and I'd be like trying to get away because I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear it a lot it pops up because you get caught up easy when people start giving you praise you have to be careful because especially if you go through a lot 
rejection and people don't really start hearing people saying how much they enjoy it and stuff like this. You have to keep yourself humble. All right? One thing that you have to learn how to do, never ask God to keep you humble. Trust me when I tell you, don't ever make that mistake. <laughs> never ask him to keep you humble. Because when you do, he has a way. It ain't mighty sweet. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to show you how to consecrate yourself. Consecrate means to separate yourself from one thing and cleave to another. Okay? So, the call of God, remember, with last night, God called to repentance. And I forgot to do this. We, I, I don't know whether anybody repented or not. Yeah, we, you, we did? Yeah. I led y'all in repentance. Okay, we're good. <laughs> they don't know I did it or not. All right, so but we're going to do it again tonight, okay? So first thing we do is everybody repent, okay? So we ask the Lord Jesus to forgive us for all of our sins um, and, um, and just, um, you know, you, just all of our sins. Just, yeah, just pray, just repent. Lord Jesus, we just come before you right now. We receive your body bruised and broken just for us. We ask you now to forgive us for all of our sins and all of our unrighteousness, our faults, our imaginations, and the, even the intents of our heart. We receive your blood as atonement for our sins right now. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for washing our sins away. We thank you for your body bruised and broken just for us right now. We accept your atonement on this day right now in Jesus' name. And we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. And we thank you for the sacrifice. Oh my God. We thank you for the sacrifice on this eve of the Sabbath. We thank you for the sacrifice. And all of us shout out in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice, Lord Jesus, for you shedding your blood just for us, becoming the Lamb, the Lamb of God, making atonement for our sins right now. And we thank you for it right now. Now, Lord Jesus, we consecrate ourselves for you. You have forgiven us for our sins, and your blood has washed and cleansed us now. As we take part in the second part of consecration, we wash our hands, oh Lord, and then we anoint our heads. And as we prepare ourselves for intimacy with you, we know that you're going to visit some of us tonight, that some of us, you are, you're going to heal bodies, you're going to release and encounters. We thank you for what you're going to do as we consecrate ourselves to you. We move from our sins. We release them now. And we take this step and go towards you. We thank you for this water. We thank you for this oil. And we pray over it and we bless it in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise and glory and honor now. In Jesus' mighty name name. Come on and give God some praise. Come on, give him some praise. Give him some praise. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Now, what we're going to do is this. Over here on this table is a basin of water and some oil and the towel. 
And each person comes up. You've already confessed your sins. Yes. Next thing to take place in the consecration is the washing. And so you take your hands and you wash your hands in there basin. You dry your hands off. You taste the oil and you wash your hands and then you anoint your head with the oil and then you return to your seat. And this is part is the consecration. The oil is symbolic of covenant between you and God. It is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, that covenant. And that's, it also operates as a seal. And the, clean, the washing is, is the cleansing part where it is um, the cleansing of, of washing the, uh, for an example, when we sin, it has to do with the works of our hands. Yes. So you're washing your hands of your sins and your work, okay, symbolically. And then the oil represents the new, newness. And so that's the covenant. It's like covenant that's being taken place. So you move from separating covenant and newness. And that's basically what has happened. All this part here is just symbolic. And as you do this, you're entering into this. And so this is what the Lord led me to do this evening while I was uh, at home. And so <coughs> first I was thought he wanted me to just wash hands and feet and stuff like this. Anoint. And he said, no, they do it themselves. They wash their hands and anoint themselves. And I, and I said, okay. He said, because they are all priests. They are all priests, and they do themselves. And he says that after, when they do this this night, and he said, tomorrow, I'm going to do something among them like they've never seen before. And then he took me, he says, today is the eve of the Sabbath, and tomorrow is the Sabbath. So, just know this, that at this moment right now, everybody sitting in this room is holy. All sins are gone. They are forgiven. You are cleansed. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are holy. <laughs> and this right here is consecrated. And you're this is the act of consecration. So just keep praising him and just come on up and start doing it. So everybody that's so everybody that's watching online, I thank you and we get ready to Finish it up. God bless you all.